Ότι αμελίας που είχαν λάβει γυγνώσκες την άμαξαν τη που αποφέρει. Welcome to Introduction to Alexandria. After conquering Egypt in 331 BCE, Alexander the Great decided to build a new city, which, as per his habit, he named after himself. After his death, Alexandria quickly became the capital city of the Ptolemaic Kingdom and the most important city of the Greek world. The city was built between the Mediterranean Sea and Lake Mariotis, which resulted in Alexandria becoming a crucial cultural hub and trading center. Sumptuous buildings could be seen wherever one turned their gaze. The royal palaces, the many temples, the gymnasium, lush public gardens, and large avenues. With its incomparable beauty and advantageous geographic location, Alexandria attracted foreigners, intellectuals, and traders. One of the most cosmopolitan cities of the ancient world, Alexandria supplanted even Athens as the most important Greek city in history. Egyptian obelisks were highly prized by Roman architects. While Roman design previously favored the use of a single monument, Egyptian obelisks tended to come in pairs and were generally located at the entrance of temples. Several ancient Egyptian obelisks are still in existence today, though many are spread out across the world in locations such as Paris, Rome, New York, and London. All of this shows that Alexandria was significantly influenced by the rich past of Egypt. Alexandria had several main streets. Its most famous artery was the Canopic Way. It was lined with sumptuous buildings, houses, and temples, and was roughly eight kilometers in length. This street was one of the most important shipping entrances to Alexandria, and often hosted processions and festivals. The width of the street, 30 meters, was abnormally large even by Greek standards. This is likely because the Canopic Way was made in a short span of time and based on an urban plan, as opposed to being slowly built over time as was usual for the era. The Canopic Way originated in the western cemeteries, skirted the gymnasium, 
and then exited the city to head east through massive doorways towards Canopus. This structure was known as the Canopic Door. Welcome to the Hippodrome of Alexandria. The main Hippodrome of the city was called the Legaeon, in honor of Lagos, the ancestor of the Ptolemies. Alexandrians were great lovers of horse racing. They were fascinated by the rivalry of these races. The Agon, as it was said at that time, that every competition brought. It was a struggle for glory. The most important chariot race was the Tethrapon. Using four horses with the quickest harness to the front right, the charioteer would race for 12 laps with sharp turns at either end of the hippodrome. The victors were crowned with garlands of olive and received prize money, but the most sought after reward was to be acclaimed by the works of poets such as Callimachus and Pindar. Hymns that rule the lyre, what god, what hero, I, and what man shall we loudly praise? Verily Zeus is the lord of Pisa, and Heracles established the Olympic festival, while Theron must be proclaimed by reason of his victorious chariot with its four horses, Theron, who is just in his regard for guests, and who is the bulwark of Akragas, the choicest flower of an auspicious line of sires whose city towers on high, bringing wealth and glory to crown their native merits. to Wine in Ancient Egypt. When the god Horus lost his eye in a war with Seth, the ancient Egyptians believed the eye turned into a vine and the vine's tears became wine. Early texts dating back to 3150 BCE contain the hieroglyph for vine. Regarded as extremely valuable, wine was highly sought after by the elite. It was also an essential part of many religious ceremonies. A millennia old tradition, grape cultivation and wine production was regimented in the way typical of ancient Egyptian bureaucracy. 
Egyptians kept careful records of winemakers, which they clearly identified on labels. Every landowner with a modicum of self-respect usually kept a vineyard. This held particularly true in the regions of the Fayum and the Nile Delta. Documentation shows that only certain craftsfolk were allowed to provide the containers required to store and transport wine. That and rigorous quality control checks established for every step of wine production shows that ancient Egyptians knew that the quality and longevity of wine could easily be affected by any number of variables, which they paid careful attention to. Egyptians had different kinds of wines, most of which ranged in quality from good to very good. The sweet shade, to which honey had been added. The soft nejem, obtained by drying the grapes in the sun. The ma, reserved for religious ceremonies. And finally there was the peor, the mediocre rated wine, resulting from the second pressing of grapes and reserved for a less discerning palate.
Welcome to Ancient Egyptian Cultivation. The new grain types of the Ptolemaic period required a great deal of water. Farmers needed to ensure they had effective, consistent irrigation. The Nile's rising and receding waters naturally irrigated most of the crops. Areas where the Nile didn't reach, such as gardens and vegetable plots, required an irrigation tool known as the shadouf. The shadouf allowed easy transport of water from its source. It consisted of a tall wooden frame with a long pivoting pole and suspended bucket. The system could be raised and lowered with little effort. Later, a sakya, or water wheel, was invented. The sakya needed animals to turn the wheel, which rotated buckets through the water. It drew the water to an elevation of 3.5 meters and enabled a great deal of control over the irrigation process. This improvement supplied larger areas and thus resulted in larger harvests. The threshing process separated the grain from its husk. Workers would spread the ears on clean ground. Oxen, cows, or donkeys were then guided back and forth to trample the grain. This continuous movement worked the grain loose while preventing the animals from eating it. Unwanted chaff and straw were swept away or gathered and added to the mud used to make bricks to make them stronger. Winnowing was the stage where workers used wooden scoops to throw ears in the air. The wind carried off the chaff, leaving the heavier seeds to fall to the ground. This action was repeated until the undesired materials were sifted out. Grain waste was mixed with manure or other organic substances to produce brick-shaped dung loaves that could be easily burned. A standardized brick size enabled Egyptians to mass produce this byproduct and use it as a commodity. Transporting large amounts of grain required ships equipped to carry heavy loads. These goods were moved during the Nile's flooding season when the river was deep enough for large ships. The transports stopped at checkpoints to accommodate customs and police controls, as well as for technical requirements and weather conditions. Having reached Alexandria's inner harbor, the wheat was unloaded under the supervision of a civil servant in charge of wheat management. Portions were distributed to Alexandria's city market, and the remaining stockpile was either exported or stored in warehouses. Grain storage facilities were located across all of Egypt. Temples and institutions had large silos, while individual houses had storage sheds. In some houses, arched cellars were built into the foundations. These watertight chambers were accessible from the ground floor through a trapdoor. 
Royal Granaries acted as the storehouse and distribution centers and managed state payments to civil servants, soldiers, and the police. Though plastered on the inside, silos weren't completely sealed and so remained susceptible to mice infestations. When the grain was ready for processing, it was poured into bowls and pounded into a coarse flour. That flour was then passed through a sieve to make it of finer quality and further ground between stones. Ancient Egyptians did not stock flour. Instead, fresh grain was portioned out each time to produce flour as it was needed. The sieves used by ancient Egyptians were unable to filter out sand and stones. Grit often passed into the flour, causing long-term tooth abrasions among all classes of Egyptians. Welcome to Bread and Beer. Beer was the popular drink of ceremonies and festivals. The festival of drunkenness was even dedicated to it. Considered to be quite nutritional, beer was also significant in the day-to-day -day lives of ancient Egyptians. Egyptian adults and children consumed beer with all of their meals, and medical texts include hundreds of remedies that contain beer. It remained the most popular alcoholic beverage until the Roman era. Recipes for beer varied over time and depended on the quality of the materials. Bakers and brewers typically worked alongside one another at the same workshop or house. Many families often produced the quantity appropriate to their own consumption, with better quality beers produced for festivals and other special occasions. The most basic recipe used malted cereal as the main ingredient. Fruits such as dates were added along with honey and spices. Once baked, bread would be crumbled into the brew to start the fermentation process. Adding grain enzymes would break down the starches, turning them into sugar and creating a thick mash. Once ready, the bread and grain mixture was compressed and then strained through a sieve with water into the mix of malt beer. Once fermented, the beer mash was transferred to large containers and again compressed by foot or with pestles.
Once smooth, the beer was stored in pottery jars and sealed with a clay stopper. It probably couldn't be kept for long and likely had a thick, pasty appearance and texture. Very little was wasted. Leftover grains were reused to make sourdough bread or combined with the next batch of beer. While there are many ancient accounts for making bread, most of the knowledge known about ancient Egyptian brewing comes from an account by the alchemist Zosimos over 300 years after Cleopatra's reign. More recently, Dr. Delwyn Samuel, an archaeobotanist, has proposed alternate antique techniques to brew beer. However, experts are unable to replicate an authentic beer since not all of the techniques and ingredients used by ancient Egyptians are known yet. Food was prepared on the floor until the Middle Kingdom, when cooking benches were introduced. The introduction of durum wheat improved bread quality, meaning that the upper and middle classes ate better. The poor, however, still made do with a diet consisting of a gruel made of vegetables, softened bread, or barley. Dough was kneaded by hand or foot, and when sufficiently blended, additional items were added, such as fruits, nuts, honey, and spices. To leaven the bread, they added sourdough or leaven from beer brewing. Ovens were circular or beehive shaped and made with clay or brick. If there was no oven at all, a bread maker used the hot sand to bake flatbread, a technique still in use by some Berbers today. Ancient Egyptians always had to fight off the omnipresent sand particles that were blown towards them. Despite their best efforts, sand regularly made its way into their food. Additionally, particles from the grain grinding stone tools and ovens they used also contributed to attrition and prematurely worn teeth. The team tried to portray this through toothache animations and commoners sweeping sand off. Welcome to the Egyptian household. Certain professions were open only to women, such as weaving or professional mourning, while others were available to both genders, including working as servants for the rich households. Social status did have an impact, though. The higher in status, the easier it was to obtain education and access different professions. Homes were generally composed of three rooms. First, there was the entrance, 
furnished with a small bench of brick, probably intended for a statue and protective divinity. Then there was the ceremonial room, meant to receive guests. The last room was either a bedroom or kitchen. Furniture consisted of basic chairs, chests, and storage. Tables were not used for family dinners. Instead, each individual had a small table of their own. Marriages were a social contract rather than a religious construct. Family was vitally important to ancient Egyptians, and children were considered a blessing from the gods. The father, mother, and their children were the nucleus of the family, and cohabitation sometimes extended to mothers-in-law, sisters, aunts, and sisters-in-law. Status and wealth played a large role in the style and size of ancient Egyptian homes. Commoners' houses were built with sun-baked mud bricks. Wealthier homes were often painted in white and decorated with various motifs. Town officials and the rich lived in mansions with numerous rooms that were luxuriously decorated. Only temples and tombs meant to last for all eternity were built with stone. Funeral stone inscriptions focused on the main member of a household. Encircling this person would then be a spouse, parents and children, possibly even siblings. These stones were so structured because there were no surnames in ancient Egyptian culture. Parents and children were a sort of family tree, which allowed for the identification of the deceased. Welcome to Temples and Rituals of Ancient Egypt. During rituals and festivals, the god was carried on a solar barge between the areas of a temple or the temples of different cities. Funerary carvings and paintings covering thousands of years, as well as the Book of the Dead, depict the same ship and ore design. Solar barges have been uncovered near or within several pharaoh's tombs. They were intended to carry the pharaoh into the afterlife. Ancient Egyptians believed that Ra, the sun god, traveled the skies in a boat known as the Solar Barge. 
The solar barge was believed to cross over to mythological lands. The god Ra believed mankind was conspiring against him. He ordered Sekhmet, the lion-headed war goddess, to kill all humans. To his chagrin, Ra quickly realized that with all humans gone, there would be no one left to worship him. In order to stop the rampaging Sekhmet, beer was brewed and dyed red with pomegranate juice to resemble blood. Sekhmet drank every drop of the brew she could find, eventually passing out drunk. When she awoke, she was calmer, and her lion visage had changed into Bastet. The festival of drunkenness was celebrated in honor of that myth. Unlike the daily rituals that took place in the temple and were performed by priests, festivals allowed the entire population of the city to participate. Festivals helped mark the passing of the seasons in the agricultural calendar. In reflecting the cycles of life, festivals offered a sense of consistency and structure for the regular citizens, thus reinforcing the sense of order that pharaohs were to provide for the citizens of Egypt as part of their godly duties. The importance of these festivals is demonstrated by their longevity. Records show that Osiris festivals occurred for more than 2,000 years. Some festivals serve to reinforce state control and promote the king's reign. Both the Opet and Sed Jubilee festivals were specifically intended to celebrate the renewal of the king's power. The temple hierarchy consisted of high priests, several types of priests, scribes, and servants. The high priest was known as the prophet. Some divinities had up to four prophets, and they were the ones to perform the most advanced and complex rituals. Egyptian priests were not confined to solely religious tasks and in fact had crucial roles in Egypt's administration, most of which served to reaffirm the pharaoh as the proper vessel for the gods. Their focus within the temple was centered on the proper conduct of daily divine rituals, rather than as custodians of dogma or the indoctrination of individuals. Scribes were custodians of the sacred sciences. Some priests were associated with the funeral rites and were considered the group with medical knowledge. The servants of the Ka were low-ranking priests who carried food and offerings in funerary rituals. Lector priests were distinguished by their ability to read and their main duty was to recite specialized religious texts in both temple and funerary rituals. Priests and all the officials who served the temple worked only three months a year, with each period separated by a quarter of inactivity, at least within the temple compound. Each outgoing group handed over the temple and their tools to the newcomers. 
Only the high priesthood remained in permanent office within the temple. The most sacred part of the temple was referred to as Jesser Jesseru, the Holy of Holies. The most sacred inner sanctuary was where the shrine to the temple deity was located. Only priests were allowed within. Offerings were given and rituals unseen by even the Pharaoh were performed. While the team chose to allow any character access to this space in some game temples, Normally, it was reserved for priests alone. Pharaohs and their priests often chose the site of these sacred temples because of some mythological connection or an alignment with the cardinal points and certain stars. Once selected, a foundation ritual was performed. The pharaoh was required to complete 10 steps in the ritual, which required a mix of offerings as well as specific construction techniques. Once the temple was complete, construction of the chamber containing the shrine or naos began. The Naos was where the god statue stood. The representation of the deity was usually in stone or wood and decorated with gold, silver, and precious stones. Smaller temples had only one Naos, while larger complexes such as the Temple of Karnak had many chambers to honor gods, such as Amun, Ta, and Osiris. Each statue was believed to be a receptacle for the presence or essence of the god's Ka enabling it to take a physical form. Through the statue, the god came to the shrine to eat, drink, and communicate with the pharaoh, or with the priests standing in for the pharaoh. Welcome to Fauna of Ancient Egypt. Both domesticated and wild animals were features in ancient Egyptian bas-reliefs as early as the first dynasty. While the variety of wildlife served as a reliable food source, it also influenced both culture and mythology. <laughs> Egypt's terrain allowed for a diverse range of animals including panthers, rhinoceroses, elephants, and many variations of antelopes.
The Nile was home to many species of fish, along with hippopotami and crocodiles. The wide variety of birds that populated the riverbanks, from raptors and waterfowl to songbirds, were all catalogued within Egyptian hieroglyphic signs. Encounters with reptiles and insects, such as cobras, scorpions, and scarabs, influenced hieroglyphs and art. While all animals had sacred meanings, lions in particular represented power and royalty to ancient Egyptians. They were so prized by pharaohs that they were hunted to extinction within Egypt.